sugar is high enough to make it through <laughs> one more uh, discussion. We've got a fantastic panel here. Uh, uh, on my uh, immediate left is uh, Stefan Savage uh, with UC San Diego, uh, Elizabeth uh, Leibert with Georgia Tech, uh, Peter Lee with uh, Microsoft Research, who for an all too brief period of time was also a <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, Chuck Beck, nice president of the National Academy of Engineering and a former president of MIT. This is the Big Ideas panel. Uh, no pressure. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I, I'm going to ask three questions. Uh, and the, the first question is, uh, what are the, uh, the, the big ideas in uh, computer science and information technology research uh, that you are most excited about. Uh, and the first uh, variety that I want to talk about is those ideas that primarily relate to the evolution of the technology itself. The second question is going to talk more about potential applications. So I have in mind things like uh, Lick Lighter in the 1960s talking about computers as a communications device, uh, the notion that this is going to create communities based on shared interest as opposed to geography and digital libraries and all sorts of other things, an intergalactic computer network, which he talked about in 1962. Or uh, uh, Mark Weiser at Xerox Park saying that we're going to have ubiquitous computing. Uh, computers would be so embedded and so natural that we would use them without even thinking about them so that uh, computation would become invisible. So. Uh, what are the ideas that are out there that have to do with the uh, I improvement in the state of the art of the technology that, that you think are, are most exciting? Uh, so I actually think um, that Mark uh, was, was right on, mm -hmm. and he just was a little early. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know we've been talking about the computer going away for, for a long time, and we're just starting to have the kinds of technologies like with uh, uh, Peter's company, Microsoft, makes the connect that suddenly makes available to the computer this notion of a person in space. And we're starting to have, I think, a little bit of revolution around computers actually understanding the real world. So the same thing, we saw this thing that happened with, uh, with graphics processing. When I started, we could you know, do some 2D stuff, and then some people could you know, try to do 3D in, in memory. And then we got GPUs, things that were specialized for doing this. There is the same trajectory that is poised to happen for vision. And real-time vision, having the computer, instead of us you know, going in, which is what's happening with social networks, us embedding ourselves into the infrastructure, the computer going out and actually understanding what's going on in the world. And you see it also, people have talked about it with speech and text. Siri is a great example. Mm -hmm. There's still a ways away from doing the things that, <laughs> that I want. But I think, actually, it's really, uh, it's, I think that part is, is, is very exciting. You know, you sh really shouldn't steal my thunder like that. <laughs> no, you know, I'm here on the left side. <laughs> All right, now it's clearly ubiquitous, ubiquitous computing, um, my colleague on the left. Um, we, we talked already about ideas that seem quaint, so I'm going to risk sounding quaint, but I'll try to, to quickly uh, compensate, which is I think technologies that allow people to collaborate together in new ways. And I think collaboration sounds quaint, and it's an overused term, and we're tired of it. But when we think about whether it's giganomics or whether we think of uh, the new fabric of science changing and how scientists need to be able to work over big data directly from the talk that we had today, we're going to have to find ways that people can come together, maybe very close to the lick lighter uh, notions, mm -hmm. uh, and are able to work together in ways that we haven't seen before. So perhaps a grand challenge problem is what would it take for a crowdsourcing infrastructure so that a person had a reliable 60K a year income from uh, high-level crowdsourcing. Um, what would that look like? I don't think we're anywhere near that. And there's a whole host of technologies from security in terms of representation of information, uh, in terms of uh, knowledge communities, and in terms of you know argumentation and working through that that would be necessary to fulfill that vision. Mm -hmm. So being able to solve a wicked problem online as opposed to yep. having to get together. Yes. Peter? Um, you know, just to add on to uh, what Stefan said in uh, Mark Weiser's vision, um, Craig Mundy at Microsoft, I think, has a nice way of saying this, which is that uh, at some point we could reach the stage where the idea that we would have a verb for operating a computer, the concept that a human operates, 
mm -hmm. uh, computational device, you know, could just fade away uh, and just have computation just all around you acting more like any of you have. I, uh, so I was going to say the same thing as Stefan, but uh, maybe another cut at the same question is, you know, what things in core computer science are maybe not getting as much attention yet mm -hmm. because we haven't quite hit the wall. And right. So just every session today talked about big data. Um, so obviously a big theme and a big idea. Um, but at some point it seems like we might start to hit a wall where uh, we start to learn less and less at some point because uh, there's maybe some asymptote on the value of the data. Uh, and maybe we end up wanting more than just correlation. We want some notion of common sense intelligence. We want some notion of causal inference. And so I think that if I had to predict what will happen over the next 10 years, at least in the big data domain, I might expect that there will be increasing pressure on the science community to understand more than just correlations of a large, very large data set. Chuck, you've done a lot of work on, on grand challenges. and. Uh, uh, so what, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, Tom, I, I have to say that when uh, Ed Lozowski and Susan Graham asked me if I could do this, I thought this is sort of ridiculous. I know nothing about computer science. <laughs> now, if I were still at MIT, I would have refused, but all of a sudden <laughs> I realized, well, I'm in Washington. It doesn't seem to be a big impediment <laughs> to not know what you're talking about to make some assertions. Uh, but so, so my uh, thoughts have had more to do with the kind of applications I would like to, to see enabled. And I must say, I was very uh, uh, humbled by uh, this last uh, marvelous talk by Professor Soleil, because these are the kinds of things I'm interested in. But I will throw one kind of impossible task out, and uh, that's that somehow we need an internet that's simultaneously secure and still has all the blessings of openness and freedom. And uh, I have no idea whether that's doable. Uh, it's probably a little bit like a time bandwidth problem. You can stretch it one way or stretch it the other. But I think from a societal point of view, th this is rapidly becoming a, a very, very serious problem. And I hope it is uh, a grand challenge that those of you who actually do know what you're doing uh, will, will take on. And the second thing, uh, very straightforward and really was said in several ways in, in the last uh, couple of talks, I do hope we can find a way to not only take on this new age uh, in which we're really moving from computer science and IT as basically uh, uh, simply having to do with flow of information, this new age where it's going to be about knowledge generation and uh, knowledge discovery and knowledge utilization. And uh, I, I hope that we are going to somehow be able to make this extremely large scale computation for simulation and extremely large scale uh, computation for data analysis and discovery and, and knowledge drawing and make it accessible. And uh, I don't think we're quite there yet on the accessibility piece. Uh, if you listen to all the hype about the cloud, you might say, well, we're kind of getting there. But I think that combination of really bringing the new tools that people like you are developing and making them more accessible is going to be really important to allow people's creativity to come up with good designs, good solutions, good new knowledge. So one specific idea I wanted to ask uh, panelists about is whether there's enough interaction going on between computer science and, and neuroscience. Um, and I'll, I'll give you one example of a collaboration that's happening between the nanoscience and the neuroscience community where right now we can measure the electrical activity uh, of maybe a thousand neurons at a time. Uh, but if, it, say if we could uh, increase that to a million, would that give us new insights into the way the brain works? Um, and uh, are there, are we beginning uh, to learn enough about how the human brain or other brains do, do uh, you know, learning and, and perception and reasoning and, and memory to re really begin to have that inform, uh, you know, novel computer architectures, for example. Do you have any thoughts? Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, I, I think that, first of all, um, at these intersections between uh, different disciplines where we're really trying to understand something, 
uh, like making very uh, smart use of computational capabilities. And I think Alex's talk was uh, really inspirational, but we also saw it in, in the other two talks in the same session. Um, so first thing to say is that there seems to be a lot of obvious low-hanging fruit there. And so some of the recent advances, for example, in just understanding from fMRI uh, data, mm -hmm. pretty conventional uh, measurements, uh, being able to understand uh, where brain activity might signal thinking about different kinds of concepts, concepts about uh, emotions versus concepts about objects, for example. Um, those are pretty, uh, pretty attractive mm -hmm. kind of uh, little hints that something really big is, is at play there. And so um, I guess coming from you, the, I always think the question has something to do with, the, is there a way that we as a community and then uh, uh, government agencies can kind of arrange things <laughs> to uh, make that uh, mm -hmm. more accessible and, and uh, more incentivized. Mm -hmm. And I think for that, it seems like it's a mistake to just create whole new programs sure. uh, to do that. It, we can't dilute the, what we're doing in the core. Right. Um, but the more that we can do to kind of encourage uh, agencies and program committees and departments mm -hmm. uh, to be open and receptive and kind of encourage uh, this kind of work, the better. Right. Uh, the, the second broad question I, I had for folks was really more looking at some potential uh, driving applications. Uh, you know, we heard from er uh, Eric's great talk about the inspiration that, uh, that health and, uh, you know, reducing medical errors and rates of rehospitalization has played in, in terms of driving uh, machine learning. Uh, you know, one goal that has come out of the um, community of people interested in AI for education has been the idea of being able to develop uh, a tutor that would, would be a, as effective as a personal tutor, which would give you a two sigma in improvement, moving everyone from the 50th percentile to the 95th percentile. Uh, what are some other uh, goals or, or visions that would be more driven by uh, an application or a use of information technology that, that you think could serve as a rallying cry for the research community. You don't want to let Peter go first this time. <laughs> I, I, I might steal it from him again. That's all right. Uh, so, I, you know, I think there, I think there are a bunch. Um, the, uh, it, it's, you know, part of it for me is that there, uh, I have a lot of my best ideas actually come out from things that just bother me in real life. And so a number of people have it talked today and talks about having uh, that we have certain amounts we can do correlation, but we don't really have understanding. And so, you know, examples of this are things like I can find Ed Lazowska's homepage via Google really well, but I can't get it to tell me, like, which parts of it are funny, if, if any. And there's a lot of stuff <laughs> you can find out there that is, that is wrong. That sounds like a low probability event. No, he has some good ones. <laughs> he has some good ones. Um, so, you know, here's, here's a, a very concrete example. I was thinking about what I did to, to come today. I'm working, I have to do slides for this. Right. I had, I'm working on a paper deadline. I'm spending all of this time taking these ideas that I have in my head and putting them into some form that is palatable to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to do that at all? Why can't I, why is that not a job of my editor? Here's the idea, punch it up, mm -hmm. here's my audience. And I would like this to relate these. No, make it more like this. Write it in the style. We can do this in graphics. We can say, draw this in the style of Pablo Picasso. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do this with other modalities? Why are we actually stuck mm -hmm. authoring things for ourselves? That would be, you know, that's one for my everyday life that I would, I would love to see do, but I think it's really hard. And, and you could have plugins for different funding agencies. <laughs> that, would be, that would be fine too, but it's it's like this, you know, this language translation, but it's you know bad English to good English. I, you know, it seems it seems totally. I, I'd like to pick up on that because you said authoring, and I think authoring is something that maybe doesn't get as much attention mm -hmm. and focus uh, from anyone as it ought to. Um, you know, right now, uh, you mentioned education; that's very hot right now, and I think we're going to see this huge explosion. Mm -hmm shortly in online education. People are just very charged up, very exciting things happening. Um, but a lot of the most in it's interesting things happening are still based on an ivory tower model. You know, the, so 
famous university professors and technologists that are fonts of all wisdom and knowledge, mm -hmm. and they have the tools and the capabilities to author things uh, and use tremendous technology to do, to have it all cognitively informed and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Right. Um, what about you know the person sitting in her kitchen wanting to make a cognitively informed podcast? Mm -hmm. It's a little nutty to think about it, but the kind of democratization of that sort of highly refined and educational content creation, you know, where everyone has something to offer mm -hmm. to the world that can teach, is somehow just not in the, uh, not in the discussion. Right. Yep. Tom, if, if you'll forgive me for maybe taking it up one notch higher in uh, abstraction uh, and uh, bringing up what I think is a really huge challenge that involves computer science and IT but goes well beyond. We're getting very good in a lot of fields at simulation tools and first principle discovery tools and so forth based on physics, chemistry, and maybe now a little bit the life sciences. But we're really nowhere in terms of being able to do big simulations that involve cultural values, human norms, right. behavior, desires, and uh, this is going to have should have very practical applications as we try to understand the movements of, uh, of people, as we uh, try to understand uh, uh, how to approach these uh, sort of cosmic challenges uh, uh, like uh, uh, global change, uh, how we think about war and peace. There's so much that at least we ought to have our eyes set on reaching out. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we've already heard uh, uh, how people have gone from uh, sort of very narrow disciplines to pie-shaped people. We're going to need cone-shaped people or something, I guess, to, to do this. But, but I do hope that while this isn't something that's going to happen tomorrow, that we right. begin working to try to eventually have that as a goal. Elizabeth? No, and I want to pick up on this thread of looking at human behavior because you know, we started at one point looking at neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And I'm just as fascinated by the tools that are helping us unpack the complexities of the human behavior mm -hmm. in the social and physical environments. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have uh, the tools within behavior and uh, imaging, new ways of uh, saying and understanding behavior, and then connecting that back to critical human uh, endeavors. I mean, healthcare should keep you busy just within right. itself. So much of healthcare is driving some form of behavior change, whether it's quote, patient behavior change within, within respect to chronic disease management and prevention, but it's also physician behavior change and, and you know, new ways of sure. working with patients and working within the system, and then taking that to a higher level, understanding new policies uh, and new ways of uh, building uh, f uh, effective healthcare systems in contrast to the one that, that we're working with now. So there's so many aspects of human behavior where information technology both can provide insights into human behavior, mm -hmm. but it can also provide ways of creating incentives and new structures for uh, allowing these human behavior to occur. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think there's so much that we can spend in, in that space that uh, could have huge ramifications across the board. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and the last uh, question I wanted to pose to the panel is, uh, there is some concern that some of the processes that we have, uh, both in terms of the uh, allocation of uh, uh, federal R&D funding, uh, the peer review process, or processes that are internal to the discipline, uh, sometimes uh, deter people from really swinging for the fences. Uh, and you know, particularly when you have proposal pressure and maybe it just takes one person on the panel uh, to say, oh, they'll never be able to do that. Whether that uh, causes people to be more uh, conservative, uh, you know, people have uh, bemoaned the lack of support for uh, high risk, high return research, uh, and have joked that you have to do the experiment before you can write the grant. So what, what are the types of things uh, that uh, the research community uh, by itself or the partnership with the federal agencies uh, could do to, to try to encourage uh, more high-risk, high-return uh, high uh, research. I can, research. I can jump in on that. Sure. Uh, 
to start with because I may disagree with Peter, so you okay. can start an argument. Because <laughs> yeah. you were talking about, you know, we, we have to protect the core. Uh -huh. uh, and I do think that as a community, we face our own version of the innovator's dilemma, mm -hmm. that we have our own system of how science and how research works, mm -hmm. and that we're quite protective of that, and we've built an entire system around whether it's tenure or graduation or funding. I mean, all of this is built within that. And we, I think we have to create the ability to have those own your garage, your disruptive experiments, your disruptive forms of science. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, uh, I picked on the NIH already today, I'll, I'll, I'll speak with that, whether it's something within the NIH where you say we're gonna do something that is uh, diametrically opposite to RCTs, that we're gonna do something with uh, uh, evidence-based discovery uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, of information on the ground, um, whether you do something that is based on uh, what seems like a crazy grand challenge of uh, what are all the different ways that we can reduce uh, the national um, aggregate BMI uh, across the population. I mean, tremendously different ways that we could attack that, but that's n nothing like that is anything that you would see in a traditional NSF or NIH call. So I think we have to find, uh, we have to face the fact that we are our own established institution and we have to find mechanisms to allow disruption. And what, what kind of venues could we create for even surfacing those proposals? I mean, I've been, I've been, um, <laughs> I've been, I mean, I've been very interested in some of the multi-agency discussions that mm -hmm. we've had, and, and healthcare has been some examples, and, and we've been dancing around how to do this in some multi-agency ways, but it still seems to be that we, we focus on one dominant paradigm or another dominant paradigm. And there hasn't been a place where people are allowed to essentially step out of those paradigms and do something particularly risky. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that is threatening to the core, but I, it's, I think you need, do need to create those unique test beds and those new opportunities um, and allow people to, to step out of the standard mode of, mode of business. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you made a point? So, so, so I, don't, I don't disagree, but I think there is, there is an, uh, another side to it, which is that um, so I've actually given this problem a, a fair amount of thought, and I, I don't, I, I think people may not submit proposals or say they don't submit proposals because they say that panels are conservative, but I, I have not actually seen a lot of evidence that it's conservative panels that are really killing us. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly, on the, I've never served on a panel where there was this killer, risky idea, and we said, Let's, we're not going to take that, they have, it's too risky. It uh, just, it doesn't <laughs> happen. Uh, I, I think that, in fact, w it is this innovator's dilemma issue, but I think it's larger than you mentioned. I think we suffer, you know, the present company accepted, from a little bit of collective cowardness uh, from the success of the last 20 years. So we have gone off and created the Internet and Google and Microsoft and so forth. And so my communities, which are, you know, systems, networking, and security, define themselves. Their, their research is all hand in glove with the problems of these multi-billion dollar industries. Mm -hmm. And when in 1960, and you said, you know, we're going to have a desk, and it's going to tell you the answer, that wasn't any weirder than anything anyone else was saying in some right. sense, because there was no computing industry. Mm -hmm. If you do that now, I mean, you're weird. You're, and so it's a lot, it's harder. All of your peers and all of the, the, the entire um, ecosystem around computing, now it's, it's more mature, and it supports a particular worldview that I think it's much harder for us to do it. So my, I'm actually a huge fan of um, these contests or these challenge problems. Yep. Basically, I kick people in the butt a little bit and say, look, we, are, we will lend our prestige and maybe a little money mm -hmm. to this. We are anointing it as a problem that's worth doing even though Google's not doing it, but it's okay. You know, <laughs> get some reassurance out there. And, and I, so that's, that's my big guess. So what's the next uh, self-driving car? That, you know, the next uh, goal like that that you think? The trick is finding something that's not too far away. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like I love, like, um, I didn't mention this one earlier, but uh, like self-assembly, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's biological or smart matter, that's huge, that's a software problem. I mean, there's all kinds of, um, uh, there's all kinds of uh, material science issues. Right. But ultimately it's a software, if you could get a version of that w that would in the end build something cool, I think you could make, that, that could be really exciting. Because right. there's not very many software people have gotten into that. So like a programmable matter competition. Or yeah, it has to turn itself into, you know, milk and then a circle. I don't know, something. Okay. Like, you know. <laughs> Your thesis has to walk across yeah. the desk. Exactly. Right. I, I really like the challenge idea also. And I think 
because there is value in having some part of the research community engaged in missions that have objectives where you can clearly answer the question at any point, mm -hmm. have we accomplished it yet or right. not, which is really what you're setting up. And I think Watson is another great mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. of that. You, you have a very clear objective and you know when you've accomplished it. Although it would be a mistake to forget about our, the great value in embracing diversity. And we have this wonderful constellation mm -hmm. of funding agencies that all right. have a different approach. And if we try, if we do anything to kind of reduce the diversity, I think we might lose something. I, I was trying to figure out if I disagree with Beth or not. <laughs> I, I can't quite figure it out. Uh -huh. But, I, you know, in preparation for this question, mm -hmm. I also wrote some notes like Beth, and I took a little different cut at it. I, I, like a few other speakers today, I went back to 1991 at the start of Matt and tried to see what was going on. And there were, 1991 was a very interesting year tech wise. Um, uh, Tim Berners Lee announced to 241 people on Alt.Hypertech Hypertech that he was starting this project called World Wide Web. And Linus Torvalds was asking some questions for a new kernel project that he was starting on comp.os at Minix. Pretty naive questions, and, but these things had huge mm -hmm. impact. I don't think you would have called them big ideas at the time, but they sparked a lot of big ideas. Right. Um, but the thing that caught my eye in 1991 was um, this was the AI winter. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Lisp machines and symbolics were near death. The Japan fifth generation effort uh, was clearly going nowhere. Um, the commercial expert systems industry was petering out. Um, and maybe most deadly in the US, uh, DARPA's strategic computing initiative decided to terminate its investment in AI research. And I was trying to think from that and now where we are, well, was that in the long run good or bad? for the field. And, um, and I'm not, I don't think I know the answer to that. Uh, it does seem like after a few years, there was a lot of really inventive new things that came out of the AI community. <coughs> and if there were federal agencies that were sort of saying, well, we think these are the directions to go, mm -hmm. right. they might have had undue influence and who knows where, where we would be today. So it, I think it's a very interesting and unclear Th there's a book about Hollywood where the, the motto is nobody knows anything because uh, right. you know everyone thought Star Wars was a stupid idea. And by the way, now that I've <laughs> moved from academia where I was completely dependent on uh, federal funding to Microsoft Research where I'm, I'm not, it's easy for me to say, well, maybe another winter isn't a bad thing. <laughs> uh, so, I, um, uh, so I'm a little skittish about saying that. <laughs> but, um, uh, but the point is um, maybe the place of common agreement is that it's very important for researchers to really have their own minds and have their own idea about what the right ideas are. And the agencies should follow that rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. yep. Tom, I have three quick, simple-minded suggestions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is do a lot more engagement of bright, unspoiled undergraduates mm -hmm. in research. Mm -hmm. Just forget the new idea. Right, you, know, right. you know how it works. And uh, uh, the second one is just sheer intuition, no basis of fact whatsoever. But I have a suspicion that the more we can encourage collaboration via IP across institutional boundaries and geographic boundaries, I think when you start crossing those boundaries, you'll find you're beginning to cross other boundaries. I can't back that up with any fact, but it's an experiment I'd like to, to try. And finally, uh, uh, I, I really increasingly am enamored of the serious big challenge approaches, the uh, uh, business model, the X Prize, and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, it's not for everybody, it's not for everything, sure. but there are places it fits mm -hmm. and it can, can really bring new people right. and new modalities of thought into the work. Yep. Great, well, uh, we have also, in addition to a great panel, a, a fantastic audience, so we uh, welcome uh, not only questions, uh, but also your own ideas that you would like to add to the mix. Henry? Yeah, I, a theme that persisted through a bunch of the talks here is going from correlations to understanding. Mm -hmm. And Tom suggested that we might look at the way the brain processes uh, information because 
obviously the brain is taking in gigantic amounts of data. It's parsing it and storing it in ways that we don't understand at all. Uh, and I, I think that, that if you look at what we're parsing, if, uh, you know, some of it is visual, some of it is sound, some of it is parsing the physical interactions of things. So I don't. I, it seems to me that there's a fundamental, deep breakdown in the way we're, uh, you know, the, a, a huge gap. I mean, as you think about natural language translation, you know, you you can translate the grammar, but you don't. If you don't have the understanding, you can't make these words. So I was just wondering, where, where are we going on this? Are you, you know, can we search the world for pictures and graphs and actions as well as, uh, you know, flat data? I mean, part of this is I'd like to point to two pieces of work that we're discussed during the day. I mean, first, just uh, looking for more natural ways of interacting with information and whether I'm, all the fun things people are hacking into the connect, all the different work that's being done in information visualization, as well as, again, knowledge communities, ways of bringing that together. I'd like to call attention to Eric's work on uh, interfaces for surprise, because he mentioned that in a very specific medical context, but I think that applies to scientific discovery as well which is uh, as you're doing the analytics across the data, what are the, uh, what are the, um, the connotations or the hypothesis or something that would be uh, least likely to be proposed by the particular scientists or team of scientists that are working? So it, it's actually uh, creating a juxtaposition. Again, how is it complementing that human approach with the analytics? And so I, right now I think we, we tend to think of big data as this uh, great engine that is working the data for us, um, but it can do much more than that. And so this notion of how you complement uh, human discovery processes is something that uh, we've really just started on. There is some in very interesting, at several universities that I'm aware of, um, really interesting preliminary work on uh, taking very, very large data sets and then extracting, in response to your question, scientifically valid experiments. Um, and uh, it's a fairly challenging uh, kind of problem, but it, it sort of a step in the kind of direction that you're mentioning. Um, uh, mentioning Eric Horvitz again, he and his some of his collaborators uh, a few months ago showed me um, a copy of the California third grade achievement test. And uh, posing the question, could we ever get a computer to pass this? And um, I think if you look at the SAT test, the answer is probably yes. But this third grade achievement test, well, you know, it's saying, it, it's asking you to understand based on li line drawings that raindrops go with umbrellas and grass goes with lawnmowers. And it's, not, it's much, much less clear exactly uh, how we would do that and how today's computer science thinking would address that problem as opposed to the more conventional thing that we see in <coughs> things like Watson in addressing a more advanced question. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. Bob? <clears throat> With every new technology, it's usually the case that people think about using it in both brand new ways and to solve old problems more economically or cheaper or more efficiently. Uh, I want to raise some questions about the role of simulation in the future. We've had a lot of applications of simulation in, let me say, standard ways. But I'd like to raise <clears throat> the question for the panel of what its potential application might be in ways that are not traditional. Um, I'll give you some examples. For example, for example, the ability of kids in school, maybe even kindergarten and up, to learn by interacting with simulations of interesting things in the world, something we don't typically do today, uh, or uh, in more general ways. I remember MIT organized a meeting back, I don't remember whether it was the 70s or 80s, but the original intent uh, was called the uh, computation of physics. And they invited a lot of people from the physics community, including uh, Feynman from Caltech and some folks from IBM and Harvard even. Uh, and the physicists refused to come because they didn't want to be part of something that was about the computation of physics because that was the real world. And they ended up changing the title to the physics of computation, which they all liked very much and showed up. <laughs> So that's an example uh, I remember Ed Fredkin from MIT talked about digital physics and talking about everything, you know, in some intrinsic digital form. It's a kind of a new notion, but I'm wondering what the panel thinks of the possible role of simulations in new and innovative ways. I'm 
can give two on completely different ends of the spectrum. One is that we're working with uh, National Academy and Institute of Medicine on simulations of healthcare systems. Uh, and it's actually a uh, multi-level system that looks at patient-based care process, the business uh, system, and then it's a city ecosystem model of that. And it's trying to take uh, it's essentially a mashup of as many engineering models as I think we've been able to find. And the point is, is that you would not be able to simulate a healthcare system to the fidelity of simulating a, a new aircraft. But you can use the simulation in two critical ways. One is that you can eliminate bad ideas pretty quickly, um, which is actually quite valuable in the discussions that we've been having. But it also provides us uh, an ability for stakeholders to come around and say, okay, if we were actually moving this for, let's say, a transaction-based model to a pay-for-outcome-based mo model, what are all of the different ways that we could work within the simulated model to get us there? And it seems to be quite effective of narrowing that design space. So again, it doesn't attempt to accomplish the full simulation, but allows for that dialogue. On the kid front, I think it's getting it out of the screen and into the physical world. So it's the combination of mixed reality and tangible media, where instead of interacting with the simulation with point and clicking on the screen, which is, I think is still too far of a cognitive leap when we're talking about kind of the youngest kids where you know, my kids are right now, but if, if they're suddenly interacting with uh, you know, things that have QR codes and they're being recognized and they're interacting with that, then the simulation comes alive and allows them to bring in all of their other learning capabilities that involve tactile manipulation as well as social interaction. Eric? Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were going to, other people are going to um, yeah, comment on response to that question. I guess I want to raise the level of the question and ask maybe a, a, a national economic and science and technology policy question. So it's no secret we all know that our research universities are under a lot of financial stress. Mm -hmm. This is a, a truism. Uh, we're also competing globally with some state-sponsored capitalist actors. Yep. You know, the whole ecosystem of what uh, ensures the competitive position of the U.S. is under stress, I would suggest. And so I was really wondering what the panel's thoughts are on what the right things we should do collectively, publicly, privately, in partnership to try to maximize the probability that the competitive position of the U.S. remains strong looking forward 20 years as we've been looking past uh, for 20 years. This sounds like a Chuck Vest part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm afraid that my uh, uh, response to it is, um, is awfully basic, and, and that is just the a number one thing we have to do is a better job of education, period. Second, though, <clears throat> I, I continually worry that somehow because the rest of the world is getting better and their educational quality is going up and their ability to compete is going up and so forth, our, our political system has managed to take globalization and make it a very dark negative thing. And so the second thing I would do is I think that we need uh, not only politicians, but we need the leaders of industry to stand up and explain the modern world to people and explain the opportunities that globalization and uh, global integration of, of everything that we do hold for us uh, as well as the negatives. Uh, I'm always, it won't surprise you, uh, very skittish about grand plans for how to organize everything to maximize our, our uh, competitive value, but, but we somehow have to do a better job of getting people to understand holistically what is happening, what the dangers are, but more important, what the opportunities are, and somehow strive to mesh that with this wonderful, chaotic, democratic, people have freedom to do what they want uh, uh, a system that I still think in the end is going to win, but only if we work within a context that, that we understand. And I think, you know, the, the, the companies uh, uh, that uh, colleagues here on the stage uh, uh, represent more or less take that attitude to things. But those would be my two main answers. We've got time for one more question, uh, Eric. Well, uh, Chuck mentioned education at the beginning of his answer, and I wanted to, to build on that. One of the great hopes of the Internet, like uh, TV before, it was that it would radically transform the way we do education. Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed that much at the university level or the K-12 through 12 level, although 
Uh, Sebastian Thrun was talking about the 100,000 plus people that he's education at MIT. There is uh, MITx at OpenCourseWare. Right. There's also uh, Salman Khan's Academy. So we're seeing little bits of, of, of things happening there. But it's interesting to hear the panelists talk about what are the what's the potential for really radical changes in the way education is done, and, and what would we have to do to, to make that possible? Well. Uh, I'll talk about two things that I think are interesting. One is, uh, and, and this is particularly true for people who don't have access uh, to any education at all. So, uh, you know, if, if you take a look at Sebastian's work, the, the fact that he was able to uh, offer this for, uh, you know, one dollar per student, uh, because the the marginal cost of making it available to more people was essentially zero. I think that has big implications for access. I think the second thing is that once we're instrumenting the learning environment uh, and you have the ability to collect the individual uh, you know, mouse clicks of a student interacting with an online or, or blended learning, the ability to do rapid low cost experimentation, the ability to drive uh, much faster and more continuous feedback loops between uh, the content on the one hand and the student uh, the instructor, the course designer, and the science of learning, uh, I think is, is really powerful. So you may be able to create what uh, Hal Varian, uh, who's at, uh, formerly at Berkeley, now the uh, chief economist at Google, calls computer Kaizen, uh, or you know, using computers for, for continuous improvement. So I, I think that's an exciting opportunity. I still think authoring is uh, key, because so much education is local. Yes. So you think of the teacher in sub-Saharan Africa, one room schoolhouse, a lot of what goes on in that school will be intensely local. And so how do we empower those educators uh, to, to uh, make use of these tools, both right. authoring and, and, and consumption? Yeah, I think you're going to see so much more experimentation with the inverted classroom, where the classroom is about teaching skills, research, and experimentation, and discovery, and then the homework, the outside the classroom activity is the access to this web of information, but the authoring is key. We have a fun challenge right now going on at Georgia Tech that is a mini version of the Khan Academy, except the challenge is for the students to produce videos of what you need to know to be successful at Georgia Tech. And so it's highly localized. Right. Uh, it may be how to get a date. I'm not quite sure <laughs> what they're going to come up with, but um, that's the beginning. Which places don't card? Which places don't <laughs> card? <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do on quilting, but okay. the, the question is creating that local ecosystem. All right. Please, Please join me. The whole, holy grail still is getting real insights out of cognitive science and learning science into the IT-based okay. yep. Please join me in thanking our terrific panelists.